The goal of this presentation is uh, one, to understand the options that are available for treatment, um, then talk a little bit about the role of um, topical agents, if at all any, um, and three, to be able to uh, describe the prevention interventions that are available for um, the management of tinea infections. Um, so the mainstay of uh, treating tinea capitis infection is actually using systemic antifungals. And the goal of the systemic antifungals is um, the ability to penetrate the hair shaft because we say that when the infection occurs, um, after colonizing the skin, it gets into the hair shaft and then grows with the hair shaft. Um, so any treatment that's given uh, for tinea capitis needs to be able to penetrate the infected hair shaft. So our uh, options that are available are griseofulvin. This is the oldest agent that has ever been. And so any other agent that treats um, tinea capitis after griseofulvin is described as a newer agent. And so the newer agents include tabinafin, um, itraconazole, and fluconazole. Now these new agents are um, more concentrated in the hair shaft and they provide uh, fungicidal concentrations after treatment is completed and this allows treatment durations to be um, shortened for a bit and gives lower rates of reinfection. Topical agents are not at all effective for the treatment of um, tinea capitis infection. Okay, so let's talk about griseofulvin, which we have described as um, the oldest agent uh, for treatment of tinea capitis infection. And it's still the first line in the treatment uh, for tinea capitis and has been used since the 1950s. The dose is 10 to 15 milligrams per kg per day and it's um, used for a duration of six to eight weeks. And sometimes this dose can be um, increased or can, the treatment duration can be prolonged for some specific infec infections. Um, there are cautions and contraindications for griseofulvin use and these are for pregnant patients, patients who have porphyria, patients with severe liver disease and um, in lupus erythromatosis. Um, griseofulvin use um, actually requires monitoring, especially of um, liver function. Now, um, there are reports of symptom resolution uh, with use of griseofulvin but failure to eradicate with some species of trichophyton. The problem with this is that the spread continues, the spread of the infection continues even after treatment has been, um, has been completed. When you go to the newer agents, uh, one of the most commonly used one is tabinafin, and the dose depends on the weight. Um, herein we give uh, doses that are weight bonded, where for uh, children who are less than 10 kilograms, you would use 62.5 milligrams per day. Uh, for children who are above 20, then you would use 250 milligrams per day. And um, for in between 10 to 20, then we would use 125 milligrams per day. Uh, the treatment duration is shortened to about a month, um, and you can see uh, this is shorter than griseofulvins, which is similar to eight weeks. The efficacy is similar to griseofulvin, um, and there is a new uh, granule formation that can be sprinkled on food that's approved for use um, um, in um, USA. Now, um, tabinafin is a little expensive as compared to griseofulvin and so its use in developing countries is uh, limited because of this. The other thing to note is that it is less effective on microsporum um, infections and it can give some side effects uh, which includes uh, a bit of uh, GI discomfort or rashes. Now, um, the other group of newer agents is azoles, and here the two commonly used ones are itraconazole and fluconazole. So itraconazole is fungistatic and fungicidal, um, depending on the tissue concentrations that you have. It has comparable efficacy to griseofulvin and tabinafin. One advantage is that it's available as a suspension. The problem with uh, itraconazole is that there are drug interactions um, um, with the azoles that um, limit its use in patients who are taking multiple medications. Fluconazole is also a, an alternative, uh, but its use is limited, especially due to cost when you're using it for a long duration of time. Um, the good thing with fluconazole is that it persists in the body for several weeks, even after um, administration, 
and one study that compared it to griselfulvin reported to be comparable in terms of use, its side effects, its compliance, and its efficacy. So it's one of the other um, agents that can be used um, other than uh, for costs that limit its use. Now, um, there are comparisons um, in different systemic antifungal therapy for tinea capitis in, in children. And this Cochrane review uh, looked at it to see um, when you're talking about um, a complete cure, uh, which is both cure of the infection and uh, visible cure, that is both fungal and clinical cure, is the older agent, that is griseofulvin, comparable to the newer agents, that's tabinafine, itraconazole, and fluconazole. And what this says, um, what this Cochrane review uh, published in uh, 2016 uh, revealed to us is that there is low to moderate quality of evidence that suggests that newer these newer treatments are, are more efficacious um, than griseofulvin, um, especially when you're treating uh, trichophyton infection. So what this really means for us is that we shouldn't shy off uh, from using griseofulvin just based on um, that it's an older agent, um, um, thinking that the newer agents are more uh, efficacious as compared to griseofulvin. The side effect profile might be uh, might be different. Griseofulvin tends to have a little um, uh, more side effects, um, and the treatment duration is longer with um, with um, griseofulvin. But when it comes to will you be able to resolve the infection, then um, uh, the newer agents are comparable to griseofulvin. Is there any role for the topical agents at all? Um, so yes, the um, topical agents can be used as adjuncts and what you use them for is to reduce transmission, especially when this is done in the first two weeks um, of infection. And what you're doing is you're trying to reduce the courage of variable spores, therefore limiting spread. So you can use them in the first two weeks, not as treatment, but as an adjunct to treatment, so as to reduce uh, transmission. They've also been reported to be uh, to cause symptomatic improvement, so you have less itching when the topical agents are used with the systemic agents. And they can be used for asymptomatic carriers who have a low spore loads, especially when you're trying to maintain the infection. They do not eradicate the fungus, and often what you do is apply them to the scalp and the hair for about five minutes, and then you rinse, and you will do this two to three times a week for about two to four weeks, or until the patient is mycologically um, cured, um, and you can be able to check this using the laboratory or using dermoscopy. So what topical agents do you use? You can use shampoos uh, of selenium sulfide at different concentration, um, ketoconazole at 2%, uh, 1-2% to zinc uh, pyrethione, and povidone iodine shampoos have been used in low and middle income countries at about 2.5%. Now there's a topical agent known as squalamine, which is a natural aminosterol that has been isolated from the shark that has also been used. Now, for the inflammatory types of tinea capitis, uh, which we talked about earlier, um, with uh, lots of intense itching, um, scab forming, uh, very distressing, then sometimes prednisone can be used during the first week to alleviate the swelling and the pain. But what you have to remember is the use of uh, prednisone does not affect scarring in any way. Uh, wet compresses can be used when you have large carrions, especially on the head that have matted hair and scabs and crusts. Then wet compresses can be used to remove those crusts and sometimes this has warranted in patient care um, so that it can be done in hospital uh, frequently um, and to improve healing. There is no role for surgical drainage, especially when you're thinking about um, carrions. Um, so let's go to follow-up. After you start um, the treatment, then you should review this patient in two weeks after the first month of treatment to determine the response. And ideally, you're supposed to verify the clearance of the infection with culture. Um, if you get an unresponder, then you increase the dose or you change your medication. 
Um, and the next thing, if you get an unresponder, is to be able to identify your source, um, human or animal, and to screen contact and to report to public health authorities. So for primary prevention interventions, um, so the things we will do to prevent children or uh, groups that are at, are at risk of tinea infections from getting um, tinea infection is of course to have an adequate supply of water for personal washing and hygiene, uh, to encourage them to have regular and thorough bathing with soap and water, paying special attention to um, moist areas and making sure they are dry. Um, then we do not share hair brushes, combs, hats, hair accessories, and letting especially children to know that, and having a lot of health education on how to prevent spread, especially in schools, um, in children's homes, um, and even for families. Now, after you've already gotten the infection and now you're preventing the spread uh, of this infection to other people, this is what you call the secondary prevention, um, then the clothing and um, the beddings uh, of the infected person should be frequently lo laundered in hot water to rid them of the fungus. Then you locate and treat the source, especially when you think it's an animal or when it's an asymptomatic individual, and you make sure that you screen all the contacts that you have. So who do we screen? Um, so we screen people at home and we screen people at school. So the contacts at home would be the siblings and the parents, especially the parents. Often with children, we will remember to screen the siblings and forget to screen the parents. And in school, you want to, um, to, to, to screen the other children um, who are using the same classroom or the same facilities as the infected child is done. And how we screen is with a careful physical inspection. If you just look with your naked eye and see if you have any scaly patches on the head, that are consistent with tinea infection. Then you can use a dermoscopy, a dermoscopy as we talked about earlier, to try and look for things that are, may not be very obvious with your eye. Are there any broken hairs? What shape of the hairs do you have? Um, then when you have fluorescent types of dermatophytes, you can use a wood light, a UV light um, with a wood lamp um, to be able to see as the hair florist, do you have an infection here? And lastly, you can do a fungal culture. So what do we do with these contacts? Um, so if the contacts are carriers, but they are asymptomatic, that means they have a positive fungal culture, but they have no physical signs of infection, then if they have a low fungal spore load, then you can treat them with an antifungal shampoo. But if they have a high fungal spore load, even if they have no physical signs of infections, then we need to treat them with oral antifungals. Now, if um, the, um, the dermatophyte you're dealing with is a trichophyte and tonsurans, then um, irrespective of the fungal load, you would treat them with an oral antifungal agent like griseofulvin, tabinafin, or the azoles. Um, for the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about um, the differential diagnosis of um, tinea capitis. Our objectives are to identify disease entities that have a similar presentation to tinea capitis, and two, to be able to discuss a few distinct feature, features of these conditions that might help us um, in differentiating them from tinea capitis. Um, so if you were to go through a list of um, the um, common conditions that would um, mimic tinea capitis infection or that we would be thinking about, um, we, we are needing to rule out when we see a patient with tinea capitis, this is the least. Um, and so one of them is alopecia areata, um, then some forms of atopic dermatitis, um, then bacterial scalp abscesses or dissecting cellulitis, especially when you're thinking about a carrion, um, psoriasis, subarachic um, dermatitis, and trichotillomania. Um, so we get to go through a couple of images of patients with these conditions and how we might be able to tell the difference. Um, so on the first one, um, let's look at alopecia areata. And the reason we place these higher on the list of differential diagnosis of tinea capitis is one, because of the age of presentation. So it has a similar age of presentation 
um, to tinea capitis, this is in the uh, preteen area. Alopecia areata is often an autoimmune um, uh, reaction where the body immune system is um, uh, producing um, antibodies against uh, parts of the hair follicles, uh, then leading um, to um, falling of the hair follicles and resultant alopecia. Um, so one of the things, and this is a patient with um, alopecia areata, so one of the things that you notice straight away is that with alopecia areata you don't have a lot of scaling as you would have with um, tinea capitis. Then two, um, we know that tinea capitis is a, uh, is a localized infection usually of the scalp while in alopecia areata it would affect um, other hairy areas uh, more significantly, more commonly than it would happen with um, tinea capitis. Um, then you would have other systemic um, symptoms um, of autoimmunity like sometimes the nails would be um, involved um, sometimes you would have patients with other autoimmune diseases like um, uh, diabetes or celiac disease, type 1 diabetes or celiac disease, and the hereditary component. So um, when you're wondering, is this tinea capitis, is something going on, then those are the questions you need to be asking yourself. Is there someone else in the family with a history of something like this? Um, is there a history of autoimmunity? Um, do you have other body areas that have this infection, uh, that have a similar presentation? Um, how is the rest, how are the joints, how um, are the nails? Um, and if you're getting a patient who is having um, history of symptoms um, that are a little out of context with what you would expect for tinea capitis, then you would think of alopecia areata. So one other way of making a diagnosis is by dermoscopy and um, this is one of the reasons why we would really insist that when you see tinea capitis you need to go a step further and do a couple of investigations to confirm or rule out your diagnosis. So in alopecia areata when you do dermoscopy and look at the um, uh, remaining um, hairs around the area of uh, alopecia then what you get is exclamation marks. Th that's how it's described and um, uh, we will get to look at this when we look at um, the damascopy slides. As opposed to tinea capitis where you get the comma hairs or you get the corkscrew hairs. And another way of uh, really differentiating the two would be doing a biopsy um, where you find different things, uh, a biopsy and uh, preps. Um, potassium hydroxide preps can help you uh, differentiate between tinea capitis and alopecia areata. Um, so the other one would be a dissecting scalp cellulitis and this is really a difficult one when you have um, carrion cells um, and um, you're wondering is this a scalp cellulitis or not. Um, and the, the, the biggest differentiating factor for this would be uh, pain, the level of pain. So obviously a scalp cellulitis or a scalp abscess is going to be really tender. Um, you're going to have a fever, um, you, you're going to have a septic patient um, um, with um, cellulitis, with uh, marked lymphadenopathy, with um, lots of fever and tenderness is actually the main thing. Um, and also from history, um, you want to find out what was going on before. Do you have somebody else at home with a similar presentation or in school? Because we know tinea capitis is one of those um, disease entities that you're getting from uh, close contact uh, with high attack rates. So often you will get a history of um, someone else who has had a similar um, uh, presentation in tinea capitis, which might not necessarily be the case with. Um, the dissecting scalp cellulitis and of course at this point it's very important for you to be able to consult and have somebody else who has seen um, these lesions take a look with you um, and be able to differentiate out uh, which of the two it might be especially also because the management is very different um, how you treat a carrion cells is very different from how you treat a dissecting scalp cellulitis um, so a third differential diagnosis of a uh, tinea capitis in sp uh, scalp infection is actually seborrheic dermatitis. So seborrheic dermatitis is very common. Um, one of the differentiating factors between seborrheic dermatitis and tinea capitis is the age. Um, so often seborrheic dermatitis will not affect children other than um, brief periods during early infancy when you get cradle cup. Um, then the presentation of seborrheic dermatitis is later, late teenagehood, mid-twenties, not necessarily children. 
Um, the other thing is the flakiness. So with seborrheic dermatitis, it's what we would commonly call dandruff. And what you get is a lot of flaking um, of, of, um, of um, the dead skin is falling off. Um, and you don't get uh, those diffuse areas of alopecia as you would get in tinea capitis. Um, it could be, there could be a little confusion with the um, multiple um, scaly type of non-inflammatory uh, presentation, but one of the distinct thing is the flakiness that you get with seborrheic dermatitis and the age um, of presentation. Um, so for tinea capitis that you're treating the second third time and um, you're really wondering what's going on here something else you need to be thinking about is discoid lupus um, and with discoid lupus we know it could be localized or generalized when it's generalized then it's very easy to tell because you will have similar uh, lesions in other places of the body but when it's localized especially to the scalp area it can be a bit difficult to uh, differentiated with tinea capitis. One of the distincting, uh, one of the distinguishing factors is actually hyperpigmentation. So if you look at um, uh, previous um, images of tinea capitis that we have looked at, often it looks hyperpigmented even in dark skinned um, uh, patients. Well, in discoid lupus, you can see that this is um, almost, it's hyperpigmented, it's going towards the dark purplish um, discoloration. And then, of course, the other systemic symptoms that would be associated with uh, discoid lupus plus the age of presentation. This is usually a presentation of um, um, females in their late teens to mid-twenties, while we have talked about tinea capitis being a presentation of boys in the preteen areas uh, between ages of three years to about nine years. Um, it can get a little confusing because we know tinea capitis also occurs more in females um, and we were talking about the uh, females who are of the reproductive age group and are hanging a lot, uh, as, uh, spending a lot of time with children or going to the um, hairdressers and so forth, uh, also being a risk that's um, a group that's at risk. But with discoid lupus, you need to be looking further. What's the color of these lesions? Do you have other lesions elsewhere? Do you have other systemic signs? And of course, one of the ways of uh, differentiating the two would be uh, doing a biopsy and going ahead to do immunofluorescence. Another um, common condition that um, you need to differentiate from tinea capitis would be psoriasis. And here what you have is almost similar presentation of, um, you have um, scaly lesions, um, you have sometimes the age may overlap depending on what you have. And one of the differentiating factors uh, with, um, um, between psoriasis and tinea capitis would be um, systemic signs. So with psoriasis, sometimes you will have uh, uh, pitting of the nails, you will have lesions that have persisted over a long time. Um, psoriasis will not oftenly be on the scalp. It would be um, somewhere else in the body. You could get a positive uh, family history. And of course, with a biopsy, you will be easily able to identify between uh, um, uh, tinea capitis and psoriasis, especially if you go a step further with your biopsy and do a mycology culture. Um, so in summary, we've looked at a few of the conditions that um, would mimic tinea capitis and that we should be having at the back of our minds when you see patients with tinea capitis, especially for children who are coming in the, um, the second, the third time with tinea capitis or tinea capitis infections that are not responding to treatment or when you see a lesion that doesn't jump out as typical of tinea capitis infection, then these things should be going through your mind and effort should be made to try and exclude them um, so that you can make proper diagnosis and treat the patient sufficiently. Thank you very much.